From the field to the film room to the war room, we've got you covered every step of the way as the road to the draft starts right now on BGN Radio. Hello and welcome to another episode of the BGN Draft Show. I am your host, Shane Half. You can follow me on Twitter at Shane Half NFL. I'm joined today by my co-host and fellow draft enthusiast, Dives. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mr. Crockpot. Be sure to check out his podcast, Party on Broad. Dives, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Breaking down arguably the best group of you know, positional group uh, in the draft in a long, long time. But there's a top 10 list that we'll be talking about today, but you could go on and on and on. This wide receiver position is loaded from day one up and through day three, man. It's a great group. Yeah, we're going to get through the top 10 today. And once we get through our top 10, I have like four more guys with second round grades that I want to get to today. So this is a ridiculous draft class. Uh, I'm excited to get into it. Also joined by my co-host on Chalk Talk, Mark Henry Jr. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mark Henry Jr. underscore. Be sure to check out his Tough Cover radio show every Saturday. Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'd be doing better if Shane let us do the top 15 you know, like like we rightfully should be doing this. I mean, we could do it. We could go top 25 here. You want to talk Luke McCaffrey? I'm ready to do it. No, nah, I'm joking. The top 10 it is plenty, uh, but I, it is – I don't even know what the over-under would be set at in, in terms of receivers to go in the top 100 or the first two days, I guess. It's got to be 14 and a half, 16 and a half, somewhere in that range. It It's, it's going to be a – a receiver happy draft. I mean, you can see it with the way that receivers are being paid in free agency. The value of receiver has went up and up and up. Yeah. Uh, and you hit the nail on the head there, given the contracts that some of these receivers have gotten, they haven't done anything. Uh, what they got in free agency. Uh, I think that increases the value of drafting these wide receivers and uh, that coupled with the fact this is just a really good class. I think you're going to see a lot of receivers fly off the board this year, uh, on especially on day two. And to be honest, I think every team, every team should be taking a receiver on day two of the draft. The ones that don't are foolish and they're not thinking long term. So I'll say that now. The Eagles will not draft a wide receiver, and you guys can all clip this and laugh later. But uh, let's go ahead and dive in. We're going to do as we always do. We're going to rank our top ten. We're going to go one to ten. Uh, and we, our top three are all the same. Uh, so we're just going to take turns talking about these guys. So dives, I'll let you lead us off here with our number one. Talk to me about Marvin Harrison Jr. Maserati Marv, man, uh, arguably the best wide receiver prospect we have seen since Calvin Johnson, uh, who went number two in 2007, six foot four, 205 pounds. Uh, but at that size, this is a dude that makes creating uh, separation against DBs look easy. He's the son of Hall of Famer Marvin Harrison, the uh, senior. He's got all the size. He's got all the athleticism you're looking for in a true prototypical number one star receiver at the NFL level. Uh, he's got elite hands. Uh, he's a great route runner. Um, he His length, his skills, his wingspan, I think, projects him to be it. Uh, a legit X receiver at the next level. Uh, when you look at 2022, this is a guy who lined up on the outside. Uh, he lined up primarily on the outside. And then in 2023, uh, he did uh, come out of the slot a little bit, 67 receptions on 117 targets. Um, and then, th uh, yeah, and 33 targets and 22 receptions in the slot. So uh, 33 targets in the slot and then, 117 on the outside in 2023. Um, so I think he's definitely best as an X guy on that boundary. Just a, just insane at the catch point. I mean, he's a guy who routinely makes circus level catches and he can do it at any position on the football field. And on top of that, he's got, um, on top of the elite measurables, he's got great production. Uh, in two years at Ohio State, 134 passes, nearly 2,500 yards, uh, 28 touchdowns, just he, he's nearly flawless. Uh, he's got the size, he's got the speed, he's got the hands, he's got the body control, the physical profile. 
Um, this is a top five pick in the draft, man. Uh, and you could ar- you could make an argument that he should go number one. I disagree wholeheartedly that you can make an argument he should go number one because the Bears are at number one and they need a quarterback. And there's a really good quarterback in this draft. But this isn't a quarterback episode. Uh, blue chip player for me. Uh, he's just he can fit on any team, any roster. Um, you know, the Cardinals at four are probably praying that quarterbacks go one, two, three, and they get the chance to draft this guy. And, uh, I mean, Dibes, you covered it well. He's he's a threat to go vertical. He had an A dot of 13.1 yards in 2023. Uh, elite ball skills, just. It's hard to poke holes in his game. If you really wanted to, you could say he struggles a little bit against press at times, but that's really nitpicking. Uh, just a blue chip prospect, easy top five pick. Yeah, he's the easily the best receiver prospect I've ever evaluated. Um, I, I've for a long time said that I, I believe it was CD Lamb who, who was the before this was who I don't think went until the 16th pick. Or maybe right, was it right the before the Eagles, man? Right before I, the Eagles. I always get that mixed messed up with what the Eagles pick was and what pick he went. But um, he went in the middle of the first round, so he didn't even get to go that high. Marvin Harrison far surpasses, uh, I think, how good CeeDee Lamb was as a prospect, and I think that's saying a lot. I mean, the size and he reminds me of just these guys that you don't want to compare a college player to. Um, I I always do this NFL comp article and I'm working on it right now. And I, when you come to a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr., you come to a guy like Caleb Williams, like you don't want to compare these guys to first ballot hall of fame legends of the sport. But when you watch Marvin Harrison Jr., it's hard to not see some Randy Moss like that there that exists there and it exists in the frame and, there, there's obviously some some shades of uh, I know the ringers comparison for him was if Marvin Harrison had a taller son and obviously there's that too for sure he's a technician in and out of his routes but man oh man I, Marvin Harrison jr is special and the Arizona Cardinals are doing a disservice to Kyler Murray if they don't make sure that they get him at, at the fourth pick I did a show on top 10 professional athletes have come out of the Philadelphia area like during the last summer and my honorable mention like looking at the crystal ball in 10 years from now was Marvin Harrison Jr. and we'll be talking about him as one of the great greats so I agree. all right well we all have Marvin Harrison Jr. number one we've all got the same guy at number two I promise we'll diversify after three uh but Mark why don't you talk about our number two uh, it is Rome Adunze out of Washington. Uh, tell me what you like about him. What I like about him is, especially in comparison to our number three receiver, who we all share, and I think that there's a big, you know, not to, to bury the lead, there's a big Rome Adunze versus Malik Neighbors kind of debate, uh, I, I think, in this draft. And if you even want to throw Brock Bowers in there on who should be the second pass catcher that goes after Marvin Harrison Jr. Now, there's some people out there who want to rank people above Marvin Harrison Jr. One might even be two spots above me uh, on my, on my uh, you know, right here. But there's other people out there who have been trying to push the neighbors above him. And I I really get upset about neighbors above Marvin Harrison Jr. because I don't think neighbors is better than Odunze. I just made a big deal about talking about Her- Marvin Harrison Jr. being the best receiver prospect I've ever evaluated. To be quite honest, Odunze is second. Um, Odunze is my number four overall player on my draft board. Uh, so it, it goes to, it says a lot that two of my top four players on my board are wide receivers. I don't, that's never happened before. Um, I can't tell you the last time I had a wide receiver in my top five, to be quite honest. And here I have two of them. Uh, Roma Dunze, he's 6'3, 212, and he moves like a guy who you would worry about the size of. You'd be like, oh, he's really fast, but he's 5'11, 180. But oh no. He runs a 4.45 with a 39-inch vert and, and has a long 32 and a half inch arms. He has a 9.92 relative athletic score. Um, in 2023, I mean, he just had a spectacular season all the way to Washington, going to the national championship game. And you know, when I say that, I, I think it's important to note that guys like Roma Dunze, Michael Penix, and you know the other top guys on this Washington team. We're going to talk about another one later. 
they carried a team that just does not get that level of success to the national championship. It's not like an Alabama or a Georgia or a Michigan. Like Washington doesn't go to the national championship. And Roma Dunze was, if not the leading reason, the number two reason that they did so. Um, and he did it with 92 catches, 1,639 yards, 13 touchdowns, 17.8 yards per catch. He scored six touchdowns on passes of 20 plus yards in 2023. One of my favorite things about him is just he's so good at creating separation late. Like the ball's up in the air and he creates separation the, the way that the ball's going. It's almost like he he doesn't give the corner a tell on where the ball's at a little bit, especially if they're turned around. He creates separate, great separation throughout the entire route, but it's it's really impressive the way he does it late in the route. Um, really, really good at tracking the ball. Uh, his, stop, his start stop acceleration reminds me a, a, a lot of Brandon Ayuk. There, there's definitely a lot of Ayuk in the way that he's able to get in and out of breaks, and it really messes corners up. Uh, it, it definitely messed them up all year long. He's also, uh, you know, he was on the Huskies, but he's a dog. He played through a, a broken rib and a punctured lung in 2023. Um, this is also a guy who was a, a big-time player coming out of high school, Nevada Gatorade Player of the Year, his senior season of high school in 2019. And again, you don't want to give out these crazy, crazy comps. But Eagles legend Julio Jones, uh, definitely, there's definitely a lot of Julio when you look at, at Roma Dunze. And uh, I'm joking when I say the Eagles, definitely not the Eagles version, we're like the Falcons version. Um, you look at the, the size comp, and there's a lot of impressive size comps you can make for a Dunze, but Julio is the one that kind of jumps off the page for me. Yeah, I mean, Julio Jones will always have that two touchdown game with the Eagles. <laughs> So multi-touchdown performance from the legend. Uh, I wrote down in my notes for Odunze that I said that he's great at committing subtle offensive pass interference to generate separation. Like it's, it, you can always commit OPI and he does it with the best of them without getting called. Uh, he also had a 71% contested catch rate. And so he's just, he's a beast. He's also a blue chip player for me. Uh, Mark, I, I talked to Mark. I was like, how crazy am I if I put him above Marvin Harrison? And there's a little bit of just being bored of talking about Marvin Harrison, but I legitimately think Adunze is on that level. Uh, blue chip player for me will be very high on my draft board when I finalize that. Um, I love Adunze. Dibes, anything you want to add in on him? No, I'll, I've been on the Adunze train for a long time. And um, for the, we, we, you can't, dismiss how clutch he was in 2023. I mean, when Washington needed a big play and the second half of their schedule was littered with close games, what was the play? Michael Penix to Roma Dunze on, on the perimeter and a Dunze coming up uh, successful every time. Uh, that was consistent. The dude is just a gamer uh, and uh, props to him, man. He deserves everything that's coming. All right. Well, that takes us to our number three, uh, which is Malik Neighbors out of Louisiana State University. He was a four-star recruit coming out of high school. He wasn't measured at the combine, so he's roughly six foot, two hundred ish pounds. We don't have official measurements for him though, um, which I thought was a little strange. But uh, he was PFF's highest graded wide receiver in twenty twenty three with his 89 catch for 1,569 yards and 14 touchdown uh, performance. When we talk about strengths for neighbors, he's got really good burst. I mean, he explodes out of his cuts, and he's got great long speed. Now, I wish I could give you a 40 time. I wish I could give you a relative athletic score, not because I think 40 times really matter, but I just like having that relative athletic score, and I don't get it with neighbors, but – I'll tell you this. He had nine touchdown catches of over 20 yards this year, which is the second most nationally. Uh, he really thrives on routes with vertical threats. Uh, you know, whether it's the go ball, the dig route, the curl route, anything that takes him vertical in his route stem makes them respect that long speed. And then he can snap off routes underneath with ease. Uh, he's a good ball tracker. Uh, and it's not just that he can run away from everybody. He finds soft spots in zone coverage and sits down to make himself available for the quarterback. He's got really good after the catch ability. He's got versatility. He took 54% of his snaps in the slot this year, took 46% out wide. So you can use him in a lot of different ways. 
Um, as for weaknesses, his release package could use some work. He can get bodied off of routes at times by physical corners, or it takes him too long to get upfield. Uh, he could improve his sideline awareness. There's times I don't think he does the best job of making sure he gets the foot or two feet when you get to the NFL down. But overall, I think he's a very good prospect. Uh, he's going to be behind, obviously, Adunze and Marvin Harrison Jr. for me, but I would feel very comfortable spending a top 12 to 15 pick on Malik Neighbors, uh, and I, I kind of think that's the range he's going to go in. Just elite after the catch threat. You nailed it. Like, that's what, like, like there's some Debo vibes with Malik Neighbors. Um, you know, LSU is kind of becoming the new wide receiver you. You know, like, you look at Justin Jefferson, you look at Jamar Chase, now you have Malik Neighbors um, possibly be developing into a top 10 wide receiver in the NFL, Malik Neighbors. Yeah, it's yeah, definitely absolutely. Ohio State and LSU for sure. They've probably put, like, I guess Alabama's got a clean too. I feel like there haven't been as many good ones from Alabama lately. I feel like it's been more Ohio State and LSU. Um, I, I, so I think with Malik Neighbors, and it's funny you mentioned the LSU receiver thing because I wanted to bring this up. Is there a chance that the LSU receivers are almost getting like, is there a Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson tax that's being like added to these guys' draft stocks a little bit? Like, is it like, I, cause I'm hearing, I've heard both those names when people talk about Malik Neighbors. I don't see those guys. Like, I, I don't think he's got that upside of, of, of becoming a, a top five receiver in the league. Now, to be honest, I didn't see that with Justin Jefferson. So I, I'm not necessarily saying that that's impossible and that he can't do that. I'm just saying I don't see that. I see him more as like a like a Chris Olave type guy or a Chris Olave level receiver. I don't know if that's a one to one comparison or not. Um, it, it makes sense kind of athletically, but uh, or at least what we what we think Malik Neighbors is athletically. Because again, because like Shane said, we don't have relative athletic scores because LSU uh, lets people run a 35 yard dash. Um, so why not <laughs> go into the pro day? Uh, but uh, yeah, Malik Neighbors is a guy who I think is a really, really good player. I think people elevating him into being like a top five prospect and up near Marvin and Odunze. I just don't see it. He's he's like number 14 overall for me. And the the gap between Odunze and Neighbors from two to three is bigger than the gap from Marvin to uh, Odunze from one to two. I just don't know if I'm as positive he's a wide receiver one in the NFL as I am with Marvin and Adunze, and that's probably size related. Yeah. All right. Well, you mentioned LSU becoming sort of wide receiver you. Uh, so dives, why don't you talk to us about his teammate uh, who's number four on my board and your board. He's number five for Mark. Talk to me about Brian Thomas jr. Yeah. This guy is just a juiced up six foot three, six foot four, wide receiver, major potential as a vertical threat and yards after the catch weapon in the NFL. Um, crazy athlete, man. You saw it at the combine. Uh, you saw it on film. Um, that's what pops up immediately when you watch the film. He explodes off the line of scrimmage. He can hit his top speed uh, at the drop of a hat. Uh, he, he's got an excellent ability to track the ball downfield. Um, and when it comes to weaknesses, I, I think he can be a little bit better as a route runner. That's definitely an area that I think he needs to work on. Um, I think he's at his best with those kind of like one cut routes. Um, and I think he's at his best when he's like attacking the middle of the field, running those digs, running those slants. Um, when it comes to technique and running those curls and comebacks i think it can be a lot better um he, he needs to improve fighting through contact um but what your what the sell is on brian johnson is being a vertical threat and if you're looking for a big play potential home run potential wide receiver brian thomas is your man you don't find a lot of guys with his combination of size and speed and acceleration off the line of scrimmage. I see this guy being a day one starting X vertical receiver in the NFL. Um, he will probably be best as a number two guy uh, from the jump to kind of just 
let the NFL come to him a little bit. Um, but he needs to add some refinement. And he needs to hit the weight room. But the sky is the limit for Brian Thomas Jr. Yeah, he's a little prone to drops at times. Uh, 10.5% drop rate in his college career. Now, that did come down in 2023. He was only at 7.7%. But you'd like to see him bring the ball in a little more consistently. Ideally, you'd like to see more than one year of college production because that's always a little scary when a guy just has that one breakout year. But um, he he's very dangerous with the ball in his hands after he gets it. He's got a ton of speed, uh, 4 3 3 40, 9.82 relative athletic score. So uh, I've got a first round grade on him. I think he could he'll probably go near the end of the first round if I was guessing. It's weird that like once you get past like those first three, it feels like Thomas could get pushed downboard some because of the plethora of guys behind him that are a little bit behind him, but there's just so many guys. I wonder if it will push him down a little bit, but uh, Mark, any thoughts on Brian Thomas Jr.? I actually think it's going to push him up. I think he's going to end up going in the teens um, because I think the other three are going to be gone so fast and anyone that wants receiver um, talent, they're going to be afraid he's going to go. I think he's going to go higher, I, but I don't agree with it. I have him at wide receiver five. Um, I don't have him as a first round pick uh, or as a first round prospect. I have him as just a fringe round prospect. I actually only have three first round prospects at receiver, um, and then I have a ton second round uh, ranked in this in my second round. Um, but he's a guy who, I mean, with his speed and with his size, it's hard to deny his obvious wide receiver one upside that, that is there. I will just say, I don't understand why some guys are knocked for one year of college production. And then I, I'm, I'm glad Shane mentioned it with Brian Thomas, because I feel like it doesn't even get mentioned um, on a lot of pods or at a lot of places that you read, but then with a guy, like maybe some of them I'm about to talk about at some point, um, it's like, Oh, well he's ranked like 15th because only one year of production. So I, it's just weird how we get to be picky and choosy, especially when Brian Thomas Jr.'s one year of production came playing on the other side of a stud in Malik neighbors with a stud in Jaden Jaden Daniels at quarterback. So um, I, I do think there's a question to be asked about that kind of entire situation and being like, did every, everyone was kind of beneficiary of everybody there. I'm sure. Um, but you know, it's hard to kind of parse that out until later. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the guy that you want to talk about. Uh, it is wide receiver Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina. He also has that one year of production you talked about and had never topped 175 receiving yards in his four previous seasons and then went off this year. Uh, he's number four on your board. He's number, uh, where's that? There's two Xavier's and it throws me off. He's number five on dives. He's actually outside my top 10 at number 11. But as I kind of talked about with Mark before we started the show, I just think it's such a log jam. Like you could tell me he has to be your number five and I'd be like, okay, I just think these guys are all so close. Uh, so talk to me about Leggett and why you like him so much. Yeah. Xavier Leggett is just a guy who he, I think his upside is so undeniable. He's just a guy you pop on the tape and he has as many wow moments as anybody else you'll watch. And, to be honest, he's a, he's 6'1", 221 for a long time, his whole college college career. He was listed at 6'3", 227, and that makes a lot more sense because when you watch him, he plays huge. He, he seems like he plays like a much bigger receiver, and I hate to compare a guy who I don't even have ranked as a first-round pick, who many don't even have ranked as a second-round pick, to a, a top-five receiver in the NFL – but in terms of playing the way he does and playing 6'4 at 6'1, there's shades of AJ Brown. He definitely has, you know, some of those plays where he just gets the ball and goes, and some of those plays where he goes up and gets it, even despite not being necessarily the biggest guy. Whereas I didn't know AJ Brown was like 6'1 until much later. Um, so. I, I kind of think that it's similar with Leggett. Nine point or nine point eight eight relative athletic score runs a four three nine with a, a, a forty inch vertical, thirty two inch arms, seventy one catches, twelve hundred fifty five yards, and seven touchdowns. His number one direct athletic comparison on RAS football is Andre Johnson. Um, so yeah, it's that's that's a pretty good pretty good one there. He's definitely a guy who you can. 
build plays around in your offense to get yards after the catch. Um, and, and he hit some of the highest. Uh, I, I believe that DK Metcalf hit the highest miles per hour in, in the NFL this year. And I'm pretty sure Leggett hit over that number twice this season um, at South Carolina. So Xavier Leggett, I, I think he has special skills at a size that I, I'm pretty sure he can be a wide receiver one if all pans out. Yeah, he hit uh, 22.3 miles per hour on the GPS this year. I was going to try to look up who the fastest NFL one is, and I can't get next-gen stats to load right now. But I'm pretty sure it's DK. Yeah, but that speed, like being 86th percentile on the 40 at 90th percentile weight is just mm-hmm. insane. Like guys that big don't move that fast, and he does. And he's not like – He's obviously he doesn't have the best agilities at, at that size at that weight, but and you want to see him improve that. Obviously, the concern is the one year production, but he's a really intriguing prospect to me. I think he's got a lot of upside. Dives, you're really high on Leggett. Um, you want to talk about him for a minute? No, he's just a dream fit with Kellen Moore. <clears throat> That's what this has been my guy at the top of round two for the Philadelphia Eagles for a long time now. Um, He's a guy that could be kind of Kellen Moore's Debo Samuel in this offense. He can play him everywhere. He can play in the slot. You can groom him as the next AJ Brown. He's he, he can, he has crazy upside. He's a great athlete. Um, And just with the hope that we see more, you know, motion in this offense, uh, he's just, a home run selection for the Eagles if they go this route. All right. Well, let's keep the ball rolling here then. We'll go to my Real number quick. five. Oh, my bad. Ahead. I was I was talking on mute there. He only had two drops this year also. So really, really shorthanded receiver as well. Great hands. All right. Uh, we'll move on to my number five. Uh, he is number 10 for Mark. He's number six for Dibes. Uh, it is Keon Coleman wide receiver out of Florida state. Um, Keon Coleman was a four-star recruit coming out of high school. Um, Oh, hold on. There's the graphic. Uh, He was a four-star recruit coming out of high school. He played basketball and ran track in high school. And fun fact, he once scored 63 points in a high school basketball game. So (laughs) you could get him out there, you know, for your team and summer pick up basketball games, be great social media content. uh, If you're, team is into that sort of thing he is 6'3 uh, which is 86th percentile height 213 pounds uh, 77th percentile weight he ran a 46140 which is not great 17th percentile uh, but he had a 60th percentile 10 yard split 79th percentile vertical jump and an 83rd percentile broad jump overall he had an 8.08 relative athletic score now his stats have never been great 2022 he had 798 receiving yards in 2023 he had 658 at florida state but i think he's just got such a prototypical build for an x receiver he's big he's strong he's got good agility and explosion for his size despite what the combine testing showed doesn't always give you a pure clear picture i still think he's an explosive guy he's got good yards after the catch ability because he's so hard to bring down um, he bullies opposing defensive backs throughout the route stem as he's running routes. Press is not an issue for him. He is a plus blocker. Uh, he tracks the ball really well. He makes some ridiculous catches. Um, now, obviously, his long speed's not great. I don't think he's quite as slow as the combine showed, but that difference between his 10-yard split and his 40-yard dash time, I think that's there. Uh, he's a little got a little bit of explosion, not necessarily the fastest. Sometimes he takes too long to gather himself out of route breaks. And I mentioned it at the top, but he never produced at a high level in college. He also never played on a great offense. He was the leading receiver for each for his team each of the last two years. So even though the numbers weren't up there, I think it was more of a reflection of the offense and maybe the quarterback play around him than it really is on him as a player. So uh, I've got a second round grade on Keon Coleman. I think he's going to be an X receiver in the league. You can put him inside as a big slot at times. He took 28% of his snaps in the slot this season, but primarily this is a guy that you want working on the boundary. Uh, 
dives anything I missed there. What are your thoughts on Keon Coleman? There's definitely like a sense of untapped potential when it comes to Keon Coleman. I think that upside is intriguing enough for him to get drafted. I think in the back of round one, uh, top of round two, um, you said it. Um, he's had some crazy catches at Florida state. That one, one handed catch he had, uh, is insane if you haven't seen it already. Uh, but I agree. Uh, it really boils down to whether or not he can create separation on the boundary um, and be an X. And I, I think he can. Yeah, I'm not quite as high on Keon Coleman because of the separation. Um, and I'm going to mention a name that Eagles fans may not want to hear. So don't say potent- JJ or they go white side. Potentially mittens, but J jaw is definitely he's not J jaw. I'm not saying he's J jaw, <laughs> but there's a part of me when I see those incredible catches and constantly needing to make those contested catches, um, putting yourself in those positions and such a high percentage of his just overall catches being contested. Makes me just a little bit nervous about that separation, and obviously you combine that four six one forty um, on there. That I, I'm I'm pretty sure that the recent record of receivers who have run that slow has not been very kind. You can definitely point to some guys in the past who have run around that range, and it's been fine. Um, but as of recent, it has it's more the Kel- the Kelvin Benjamins of the world, um, and I just there's so many good receivers. In this class, I'd be making my bets either on maybe a size concern or maybe someone's injury concern. I, I just think that there's bets in this class in terms of wide receivers that I'd rather make. That's fair. All right. Well, let's keep moving here. Uh, we're going to go to Dibes' number seven receiver. He's number eight uh, for Mark and I. Uh, Dibes, talk to us about A.D. Mitchell. Yeah, I know Mitchell, man. Um, I'm putting him – Above Xavier Worthy, who we'll be surely talking about a little bit, just because I think he's more of a physical kind of wide receiver than Worthy. But A.D. Mitchell, man, he's um, he two, he does two things really well. He separates and he catches the ball extremely well, man. Uh, this was one of the biggest stories of the 2024 NFL scouting combine, crazy good 40-yard dash time of 4.35. He was one of only two wide receivers at the combine since 2015 to run a 4.35 or less in the 40 and measure at least six feet, uh, two inches tall, and weigh at least 205 pounds. The other dude was DK Metcalf, and he was pretty good. Uh, So... Uh, he had a 997 raw athletic score out of a possible 10. Um, he's 21 years old. He's a near elite route runner. Amazing explosiveness, as you saw at the combine. Great footwork. I see the twitch. Um, I think when it comes to him as a prospect, he has the athleticism to threaten vertically. Uh, he has the athleticism to create extra space. Um, and he's got great hands. Like, so this guy is just a terrific prospect, man. Um, and definitely has upside to develop into a potential number one, uh, down the road. Um, I think like a Keon Coleman, uh, he's probably going to be more of that X kind of receiver on the boundary. Um, and when all is said and done, I wouldn't be surprised to see him develop into a potential top 10 NFL wide receiver, AD Mitchell. Uh, is a stud. All right. Mark, anything you want to add on A.D. Mitchell? No, I mean, Dives hit most of it there. I'm a little bit higher on the other Texas receiver. Um, But, I mean, it is – I have them literally ranked next to each other in their overall (laughs) rank, which is funny to have the Texas receivers back-to-back. But, um, yeah, I I just – I he's it's hard to – hard to deny the athletic profile uh, of Mitchell to – obviously, at 6'2". Being able to move the way he can, jump the way he can, pretty incredible athlete. All right. Well, Mark, let's go to your number six receiver. Uh, He's number nine for both Dibes and I. Talk to us about Troy Franklin out of Oregon. It's funny. I thought this was a Dibes guy. I didn't know I was stealing this guy from Dibes here, having him all the way up at wide receiver six. 
Um, he has been talking about him all year and I think he got in my head early and I watched a lot of Oregon. I watched a lot of Troy Franklin and I was impressed every time. Um, and I think there's a chance Bo Nix was a little bit of a Troy Franklin merchant at, at times <laughs> there at, at Oregon. I think Franklin made Nix may look a lot better than he actually was and made making uh, some easy reads, maybe even easier for Bo Nix there. Um, 6'2", 176, obviously that's going to be a concern. Um, with, with his weight being down there at 176. I think there's a lot of Zay Flowers um, in, in Troy Franklin. I'm curious to hear if Dives uh, kind of sees some similarities there because I know he's a big Zay Flowers guy. Um, Troy Franklin are a little taller than Flowers, uh, but I, I think that there's a lot of similarities in the way that he gets in and out of breaks and the way that he uh, kind of runs routes there as well. Uh, Zay Flowers probably had the best rookie year of the of the receiver class last year. Unless there's someone, or besides Puka, but I, I, Puka was like a late round pick. I wasn't thinking about Puka there. Um, but yeah, uh, Troy Franklin, 81 catches, near 1,400 yards, 14 touchdowns, over 17 yards per catch. Um, he's just a big play threat uh, waiting to happen. And I, I think that he's like a really interesting guy. If, if you're like the Chiefs, if you're a team uh, that's at the end of that first round, maybe even the 49ers, that's looking for kind of a, a guy who can you can build plays for in your offense, uh, the, he's a big play threat waiting to happen. He's kind of the inverse Keon Coleman. He's got that 82nd percentile 40 time, but his 10-yard split was only 19th percentile. So he's got yeah. the good top speed. But I thought it was interesting just when I was looking at those guys back to back and just their mock draftable spider charts. I thought those were interesting. Yeah, the Zay Flowers not as interesting because I think I have they're both in that same kind of that area, like late first round, high second round, kind of um, where I thought Zay Flowers would have been drafted. So uh, I think Troy Franklin has got some of those same skill sets. He's a Yak King. Uh, he's got he's a burner. Um, I'm a little worried about his frame. Needs to fill out, needs to um, improve there because uh, he could probably get swallowed up at the NFL level. But um, in an offense that kind of designs him open, uh, watch out because he could take it to the house. Yeah, he, he did have a little bit of a drop issue this year. His, his drop rate went up this year. Um, he had a really good 2022 as well, but better 2023 even with the drop oh. rate. Um, like I've said, there's some frame issues, not a blocker He's not a guy you're, you're expecting really to block at all, but, um, yeah, he's not just a, he's like, he's not just a vertical threat. Uh, I do think that there's a lot you could do in terms of like slants and things in the intermediate game a, as well, but th- it's hard to talk about anything but the deep ball threat because 14, 14 catches for 20 plus yards, six minutes in the country, seven touchdowns on, on this place, fifth most in the country. I mean. That's what you're drafting him to do. I don't see him as a number one guy. Do you? I see him as like a, a really good number two. Was Deshaun a number one guy? That's a great question. I don't. I'm not that. saying he's Deshaun, but because uh, Deshaun ran probably like a four. What did what did Deshaun run? Probably like a four two seven would be my guess. Um, and Franklin ran a four four one. Maybe I'm over. Maybe I'm over emphasizing how fast Deshaun was. Uh, but I do think Deshaun was probably a, a bit faster than Franklin, but. He could be that Deshaun Deshaun ran a four three five. Okay, okay. That's not that crazy then. Four four one. So yeah. What was how what was Deshaun's height and weight? Deshaun was 5'10, 169 Mm -hmm. pounds, which is 12th and second percentile. Respectively, he had a 91st percentile 40 yard dash at 435. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to compare too many people to such an anomaly in Deshaun Jackson, but uh, yeah, it, I'm not saying he's Deshaun, but uh, it is interesting to like, could he be that type of guy who fills that role where maybe he's not a hundred catches, but maybe he's 75 and still that huge big play threat. Yeah. Um, I think, I think Deshaun's impact wasn't so much on the field, but off the field, like how much defenses had to get yeah. and, and plan for Deshaun and the gravity he held offensively was just massive. Um, Mark, you would have never drafted Deshaun Jackson. He had a 7.5 relative athletic score. That, <laughs> that's, in, that's in the yellow. We, we don't, we don't get up. We don't get out of bed for anything below a nine. You know, what's funny about that though. Like 
I feel like two years ago, if we saw like an 8.4 relative athletic score, we were like, oh, that's that's really good. Like, that's good. That's and now I see like 8.8 .8 and I'm like, eh, this is not a yeah. game. Like, it is so <laughs> funny. Like, it Prospects are like, learning how to game the combine. Yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. It, it's it's crazy. The the relative athletic scores, when you're just going through them, especially these top prospects, when for the purposes of what we're doing, it's it's jarring how high these are. Yeah. All right. Well, let's keep plugging along here. Uh, we're going to go to my number six receiver. Uh, he's outside of both of your top tens. Uh, it is Lad McConkey, receiver out of Georgia. And I forgot the graphic again, so let me throw that on the screen. Uh, Lad was a three-star recruit coming out of high school. Uh, he is 5'11", 186 pounds, which is on the smaller side. Uh, he has 10th percentile arm length. Sixth percentile hand size, uh, but he did run a four three nine forty. Uh, he had a sixty ninth percentile broad jump. Altogether, he has a nine point two six relative athletic score. Uh, I think he has. Uh, he's got great acceleration to his top speed, which is also great. That four three nine speed. Uh, he can be a vertical threat. He can run other routes off the vertical route tree after he threatens vertically. Uh, he's got good flexibility and change of direction. Like the number one thing that sticks out to me watching him, the word that comes to mind is just smooth. He's smooth in everything that he does. Uh, he's a really good route runner. And I think he sets up his routes well. He, I, I would say he's one of the better route runners in this class, in my opinion. Um, he thrives against zone coverage or off coverage, anything that gives him room uh, to get ahead of steam and, and you know, get into his route. Uh, Un, unabated and uh, we'll talk about that here in a second but uh, he's a yak threat like he transitions from receiver to runner seamlessly he's got punt return experience so he can help you out on special teams but he does have a really small frame and that manifests itself in really poor strength which means he struggles through contact off the line of scrimmage and in routes especially against press coverage uh, so he's going to struggle against press he's not a contested catch threat it's possible. Uh, is he injury prone? Uh, he missed the first month of this season with back issues. Then he missed two more games later on in the season with an ankle injury. Now those aren't related, but anytime you've got a smaller guy start stacking up injuries, it is something you want to ask the question about. And then he was just never a big producer at Georgia. Uh, his career high was in 2022 when he had 762 yards. Now, that did lead the team among all receivers, but it still wasn't elite production. Uh, I've got a second round grade on him. I think he's a Z receiver, you, kind of your typical deep threat. You could put him in the slot a bit. He was in the slot 25% of the time, uh, but Lad McConkey is a guy that really interests me. I think he's a really, really good route runner with great top end speed. Yeah, the, he's a weird prospect for me. I'm I'm really low on Lad, to, to be honest, and I think Shane really covered the – the negatives um, pretty well. Like he, I think you touched on the, my questions where it's just um, I, I, he might be a little injury prone. I, I, he never produced at an elite level in college. Um, I, I think that there's going to be some issues with the press. Like I, I, yeah, I just think out of all these guys, he's not the one that I would want to make my bet on. I know that he graded out really athletically. He's not a guy who, watching the games i ever really felt like oh my gosh his athleticism's jumping off the screen um I, I felt like he was put in pretty amazing situations to to succeed and to do it as a gadget player i guess or whatever a 50 catch a year guy is but uh, i and i think he could be that in the nfl i think he probably will be that that like 40 to 55 catch a year guy um a wide receiver three on your team that's kind of what i think he'll be um i just don't see that like top 50 NFL receiver upside with lad. He met with the Philadelphia Eagles. That would upset me. <laughs> let's, uh, let's put this out there right now. <laughs> lad McConkey would be an upsetting draft pick for. for yeah, he's Eagles. definitely going to be on the radar and he met with the Eagles. So that would upset. Me. All right. Well, let's keep rolling here. Uh, well, the Eagles, get to... By the way, the Eagles would never draft anyone from Georgia. So yeah, I don't know. Never, not one. Yeah, that's an absurd. <laughs> that's no no offensive there. players, at least. Yeah. <laughs> draft him and move him to cornerback. Okay. 
Let's get to the other Texas receiver, uh, Xavier Worthy. Now, he's number seven for Mark and I. He's number eight for Dives. Uh, Just so we're all talking about the same amount of players, we gave this guy to Dives to lead us off on since we're all so close. So, Dives, talk to me about the combine 40-yard dash record holder, Xavier Worthy. Yeah, when it comes to Xavier Worthy, you got to talk about the, the, the combine uh clocked in a record setting 40 yard time 425 on the first attempt 421 then then a 421 which beat John Ross uh 422 in 2017 um and that's really like this guy's just a ridiculous athlete man uh and he's only 20 years old so uh you pair that with his 41 inch invert his 10 foot 11 broad 75 catches for over a thousand yards and five touchdowns in 2023. Uh, you got a heck of a prospect. This guy wins in three key areas, speed, athleticism, and route running. Uh, and as you saw, that speed is truly elite, uh, which would instantly make him one of the fastest players in the NFL from day one. Uh, that speed to just blow by defenders and create big plays down the football field. That's going to be his bread and butter. Um, he's got great leaping ability. He's got great ball tracking ability, great body control. He can make difficult catches in traffic. Uh, and he's a really good runner after the catch as well. Um, so um, he, he's underweight for a wide receiver. That's the big negative. It's the frame. And that's why I'm a little lower on him than, than A.D. Mitchell. Um, 172 pounds, definitely below average uh, for an NFL wide receiver. So definitely needs to hit the weight room at the next level. But I see this guy uh, getting into the end zone uh, in the NFL on a regular basis for years to come. Yeah, you you said 172. Was that a pro day number for him? I, that's, I believe so, yeah. Okay, so combine he was 165, which okay. is just – unbelievably small like he's so compared he's, so he's 165 yeah so he, he's compared to deshaun jackson he's four pounds lighter but an inch and three quarter an inch and a quarter taller so it's not just that he's lighter than deshaun he's lighter while also being an inch and a quarter taller uh, <laughs> unbelievably small um and all the issues that come along with that but yeah i mean he's insanely fast uh, that's the way he's going to win is with his speed, speed, speed. dives. When you said there's three ways he wins, I thought you were just going to say speed, 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 but More speed. Uh, that's it. That's his game. And sometimes uh, people tend to double count that. It's like, we know he was fast, but then he runs fast at the combine and everybody freaks out all over again. And I don't really, I haven't seen that much discourse that I think falls into that category this year, but uh, he's a fun guy to watch. I'll be really interested to see how it translates to the next level at his height and weight. He's he's like Ricky Bobby. He wants to go fast. I mean, that's that's what really. The, but but Shane, I didn't mean to interrupt Shane, but he he mentioned what he was at his pro day and what he was at the combine. I don't believe anything from pro days in 2024. <laughs> I'm just done believing that pro days are on the level uh, in any way um, because I think that they are uh, a kind of a PR creation at this point, but um, I, I ran a, I ran a four one forty at my pro day yesterday. <laughs> yeah. At my pro day, I actually had a 45 inch vertical. Um, so that, that was, that was really what set me apart. My relative athletic score jumped up a couple notches there when they did that. Um, but the, the Xavier worthy, uh, um, he famously ran the four two one forty at the NFL combine, which felt like really like, one of the bigger NFL combine moments of all time, just in terms of like it went super viral. There was so much talk about it. Um, and the big news from it was that Patrick Mahomes tweeted about it. And, and apparently Patrick Mahomes also texted Xavier Worthy about it. And, and they talked to Xavier Worthy. They asked him about it afterwards. He said, in a perfect world, I definitely would want to go to the Chiefs. Just the way Mahomes and the Chiefs improvise and use you. They had Tyree Kill the way they used him. I feel like it would be a perfect fit for me. If you are... Xavier Worthy, like, or Xavier Worthy's agent, like, you should just be setting Xavier Worthy up, like, outside of wherever Patrick Mahomes goes every day to, like, get him to, like, throw him balls and to, like, get on his good graces to get the Chiefs to draft him. Because if the Chiefs draft Xavier Worthy, he's probably going to be a Hall of Famer. 
It's just like putting it that simply, like if you gave Patrick Mahomes someone with that speed, we can have all the concerns we want to have about his frame. But sometimes it really is for these wide receivers and quarterbacks and play, play, uh, positions like that. It really just does matter what, what what spot you go to. I think there's a lot of teams that if they drafted Xavier Worthy, I'd be bringing up his size and I'd be concerned. But if he goes to Kansas City, uh, that'd be pretty scary. If he goes to Buffalo with Josh Allen, uh, that'd be pretty scary. Like. It really guys like Xavier Worthy and I, I know Shane in general thinks that this wide receiver class is extremely extremely muddled uh, at, at a certain point, which I agree with to to a certain degree. And with some of these guys, it really just depends, you know, what guy, what type of guy you're looking for. But three years of really good production um, at, at a really high level, multiple quarterbacks that he's played with now at Texas. Um, obviously, a great athlete. Uh, I, I'm in on Xavier Worthy. I know that the the size concerns are there. I. I I don't see many scenarios that he's not at least something that you can build into an offense. I think you need to pump the brakes on the Kansas City Chief Hall of Famer. I don't know. We have no <laughs> evidence. We have no evidence that Patrick Mahomes could play with a fast receiver or anything like that. So no, no history of him playing the, with a guy that fast. People don't realize like how historic Rasheed Rice's rookie year was, by the way, too. That's another guy when I when I mentioned earlier the best rookie year. Rasheed Rice was unbelievable. I saw a list of uh like receivers that Rasheed Rice had a better rookie year than. And it, I, it was a shocking list. It was these guys who I like remembered having such amazing rookie years. And he was even better than that. So it's just whatever receiver goes, because I think they're going to take a receiver. And if they do in the first round, whatever receiver goes should literally just like like just throw a parade like just throw a parade in your hometown yeah all right well let's keep rolling here uh mark you're up next here with your number nine he's number 10 for dives it is jalen polk out of washington uh, a guy he's not in my top 10 he just missed but i also have a second round grade on him as well uh talk to me about polk yeah jalen polk's a guy who i think uh, kind of went under the radar a lot of the time because all the all the focus was on uh, Odunze. And not to mention Jalen McMillan, their wide receiver three, is another guy who's probably going to get drafted in maybe the third, fourth round as well. So just a, just a whole lot of, of, of receivers and a whole lot of guys to pay attention to there at Washington. There's a lot of Jacoby Myers, just like incredibly smooth, incredibly sure-handed, um, can r- make really difficult catches in traffic. Um, I, I think that he's, you know, I think he's a perfect wide receiver too, to kind of slot in. If you have a really solid wide receiver, I think he's the perfect guy to kind of throw on the other side. He's extremely, you know, sure handed. He's going to make the plays. He's not going to, you know, screw you on the other side of having a really good player. Kind of, I, I guess I'm saying that because he was on the other side of a dune say, I just realized as I'm, as I'm saying that that makes a lot of sense, but <laughs> Yeah, he had two, one pretty solid year in 2022. Um, 41 catches, 694 yards, six touchdowns, 16.9 uh, yards per catch. But he was even better uh, in 2023 for 69 catches, 1,200 yards, nine touchdowns, 16.8 yards per catch. So the same same level of yards per catch. I don't think he's looked at as some you know huge yak threat necessarily, uh, but really good. I mean, that, that's a pretty good yards per catch number there, and uh, it, there's pretty good numbers to support that he can be a little bit of a deep ball threat. Um, also had 13 contested catches uh, nationally. So he's re- or, or 13 contested catches, which was pretty good nationally for, for, in terms of his ranking. Really, really good at going up and getting the ball. He's just kind of a, a little bit of a jack of all trades. Obviously not a, not a high end speed guy four five two. he ran, but still an 8.77 relative athletic score, which again, like I said, couple of years ago that would have been like cool 8.77 that's a good athlete now it's like yeah get out of my face but he's a guy who you kind of have to look at and you watch the tape and really really impressive i know mcshay said he has the best hands um among any receiver in this class in his opinion yeah and even with that 40 yard dash time he was 76th percentile on his 10 yard split so uh i feel like he gets to that top speed pretty quickly it, mm-hmm. the top speed's just below average. So uh, I, is anything you want to add in there? I'm really curious about this guy's potential in the slot uh, in the NFL. Like I, I think his best, I think his bread and butter is making difficult 
uh, contested catches and his fluid route running. And um, I think he could be uh, with his size and ability to fight through traffic. I, I think there's upside there. Um, Jalen Polk. All right. Well, let's finish it off here. Let's go to my number 10, a guy who didn't make the board for you guys. It is Roman Wilson from number Michigan. 11. He number 11 for you. Yeah. So uh, he was a four star recruit. Uh, he is 5'10, 185 pounds. Uh, he ran a 4'3940. Uh, overall, had a 7.46 relative athletic score. He was PFF's 18th highest graded wide receiver this year overall. Uh, he's got really good speed and he's a quick accelerator, like tremendous short area quickness. Uh, I think he snaps off routes uh, really efficiently. Uh, he's got fluid movements. Uh, he varies his tempo and routes, so he doesn't really tip his hand to, rec- uh, to defensive backs what's coming. I think he is one of the better route runners in this class. He's just always open. Um, he's got great hands. He only had five drops in his entire collegiate career. So he's sure-handed. Uh, he processes zone coverage. He finds the open spots well. Like He just screams slot wide receiver, and he took 66% of his snaps in the slot for Michigan. Now, obviously, he's got a small frame, and so I do. I think he's limited to the slot. Like I don't think you want to be putting him at the boundary, but I, I feel like the NFL devalues slot corners and slot receivers too much. Like Having a guy that's a lead in that area opens up the middle of the field so much for you. Um, I will say, I don't think he's a very good yak player. Like he's straight line fast and I feel like he's quick, but he just doesn't have elusiveness. I can't really put my finger on why that is, but he's just not the best yak player. Obviously. I mean, you would expect this, but I'll mention it anyways. He's a poor blocker at that size. But uh, if you need a slot only receiver, uh, I think he's a good value there. And so uh, he's the number 10 guy on my board. I like him a lot. I like he's a guy that's been climbing up the boards like crazy. Um, he was dominant at the senior bowl. Uh, nobody could keep up with him. And that includes Quinion Mitchell, uh, who is possibly CB one in this draft. Um, I think there's a chance that he has untapped potential. Uh, I think he's probably better than what we saw at Michigan. And I think, like you said, Shane, I think in a role at, in the slot uh, in the NFL, he could be excellent. Um, and I think this is another target for the Philadelphia Eagles in that day two area as well. All right. I, I, he's a really direct uh, athletic comp to Emmanuel Sanders which I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that's a, that's a pretty good comp. I think Tyler Lockett, there's a lot of Tyler Lockett there in the way that he's maybe not an RA, uh, a, you know, a relative athletic score guy, maybe not a, or, or maybe not a yak guy. Um, but I, I, I don't, he's not a guy who gets me excited in terms of upside, like a wide receiver one upside, but I'm pretty sure he will be a really solid NFL receiver. Uh, yeah. So I, I have him at, at wide receiver 11. All right, so here we go to recap. Uh, We all have the same top three, Marvin Harrison Jr. one, Roma Dunze two, Malik Neighbors three. Uh, Then from four to ten, I have Brian Thomas Jr., Keon Coleman, Ladd McConkie, Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell, Troy Franklin, and Roman Wilson. Uh, Mark has four to ten, Xavier Leggett, Brian Thomas Jr., Troy Franklin, Xavier Worthy, A.D. Mitchell, Jalen, Jalen Polk, Keon Coleman. I don't know why I always have trouble saying Jalen Polk. Uh, too many <laughs> L sounds. Uh, and then dives from four to ten has Brian Thomas Jr., Xavier Leggett, Keon Coleman, A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, and Jalen Polk. Like I said, this is such a deep wide receiver class. There's so many good receivers here. Uh, I want to give you guys a chance to shout out any honorable mentions that you might have. Guys who just missed your cut a favorite day three target, a guy that's really big, a guy that's really fast, uh, dives, anybody stick out for you that you want to give a shout out to? Uh, obviously, Western Kentucky's Malachi Corley. Um, if you're looking for another slot guy, he was my number two uh, in terms of best in the slot. Um, he, he's dominant there, man. Um, there's definitely a lot of Brandon Ayuk and Amon Ross St. Brown in his game. Um, in the right offense, like you talked about, Xavier Worthy, 
with the Kansas City Chiefs in the right offense with Corley. Uh, get this guy in space. He's electric. So Malachi Corley is a big one. All right. Yeah. My, Malachi Corley is a name that you'll hear out there a lot. Probably comes off the board on in, in the second round as well. Uh, Mark, is there anybody that you wanted to give a shout out to before we get out of here? Yeah, a guy who did not do well at the Senior Bowl, but maybe made up for it um, at the Combine is Johnny Wilson, um, a guy who I've been high on for a long time. He's six foot six and a half, um, and he runs a four five three. So he's only a six six four in terms of his six point six four because of his forty yard dash in terms of relative athletic score. But when you consider that that's coming from a six, six and a half guy. Um, it, it's pretty unbelievable. A 9.73 relative athletic score. Um, he's a guy who, as a sophomore at Florida State, had a, a season with 43 catches, 897 yards. So he had 20.5 yards per catch that season. Um, this season, 41 catches for 617 yards. There's some people that think he could be working out as a tight end um, for, for some teams potentially. Um, and maybe you could make that switch, but – I just think when there's a guy who's so tall and moves so well, maybe there is some kind of some route running concerns. Maybe he's not the most smooth route runner and technician out there for a receiver. Um, and I think that showed uh, for during the senior bowl, but I, th there's plenty of tape out there of him just being simply too big for anyone to deal with. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this episode of the BGN Draft Show, ranking our top 10 wide receivers. If you've been tracking along with the show, we have been through every position group except for tight end and defensive back. So we'll cover those over the next two weeks. Uh, then we're going to get a mock draft in before we do our final podcast before the draft, talking about our my guys and the biggest disagreements we have on our big board. So if you're enjoying the content, be sure you hit that subscribe button so you get all the shows on the feed so you get notifications for when our shows drop. Uh, you can check us out on Twitter. I'm at Shane Half NFL. Dibes is at Mr. Crockpot and Mark is at Mark Henry Jr. And we will catch you guys next week for another episode of the BGN Draft Show. Go Birds!